Hi guys. Uh, the number of people joining is reducing every week. Yeah, I'm gonna just wait for the first five minutes. In the meanwhile, you guys, if you have any questions from the previous session, please do let me know. Hello, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, please tell me. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, actually, ma'am, uh, just that uh, when we talk about biotechnology, uh, people generally, uh, first instincts of that is uh, always negative in perception. Uh, they don't think about the possibilities and the uh, uh, brighter future with, with what it brings. It's just that, okay, okay, nahi, uh, ye ho gaya to, uh, sara bura ho jayega, aise, aise. It's totally a negative perception, ma'am. Uh, can you bring some light here? Okay, why does it happen all the time? Even though it's far away from the thing what people usually do tell. Yeah, that's, that's true because uh, we always like this uh, uh, catchphrases like organic, natural and all that, right? When people uh, tend to believe that anything that biotechnology does is unnatural and artificial and and uh, modified especially uh, this whole negative thing around biotechnology came uh, because of uh, genetically modified organisms like pt when when they had a huge impact uh, on uh, the natural resources that's when this uh, whole thing caught on uh, uh, you know that artificial things are bad and especially genetically modified things are bad uh, and and, and uh, people often forget about the uh, positive things that biotechnology has given us uh, uh, everything so anything that that uh, people have you know used uh, to make our lives better including as simple as pasteurization of milk was uh, a product of biotechnology even though at those times uh, the term biotechnology was not really famous uh, these are all uh, principles that are uh, the basis of biotechnology but because of how uh, certain things have have you know caught up in uh, the commercial market especially related to um, genetically modified crops genetically modified organisms people have always associated biotechnology with this whole negative uh, uh, image uh, altogether but biotechnology like we've been discussing in the past few classes has a lot of scope to a lot of better to do a lot of better things for the environment and also for the people without really having those negative effects. The negative effects are usually because of the over overuse of uh, the technology itself. Uh, even in the case of genetically modified uh, crops or organisms, people started overusing them because they start they give more yield and all that. And that is why uh, we started seeing the negative effects and the downsides of biotechnology so anything has to be used in modulation and that applies to any uh, uh, technological advancement as well so um, as far as biotechnology is concerned it is always uh, uh, you know done with the ethical uh, things in mind let it be uh, animal testing or environmental uh, you know, uh, waste generation or even waste management, everything, uh, there is always an ethics component associated with it. As long as the people who are manufacturing it and the people who are using it are following those ethical practices, I think uh, um, 
there is no necessity to uh, uh, you know tag along this negative uh, um, image for biotechnology all right it's around 6 5 uh, I'm not sure if more people are going to join Anyway, uh, let me just share my screen and right. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you so much for the confirmation. Uh, yes, sir. Today is the fifth session, so we are almost nearing the mid of the course. So there are totally twelve sessions, and we are almost nearing uh, the sixth session. Uh, so far, we have discussed a lot about um, microbes, how they are used, their ecology, uh, how to use them, the techniques in microbial ecology, and so on. And today is going to be a similar session to get this. Do this. Yeah. So today is going to be a similar session to, but here we are going to talk more about. Uh, the physiology of the microbes and how to understand them better. Uh, microbes are the most basal living organisms. Uh, we can very conveniently say that they are the first uh, living forms that started living on the earth. Uh, the first uh, organism that was able to um, take in carbon sources and produce energy uh, for its survival uh, was a microbe and later on in the future um, more and more organisms uh, started grouping together forming um, uh, communities um, uh, microbes were later on later entered into a symbiotic relationship uh, with higher order organisms uh, so even now there is a theory that um, all of our cells have uh, mitochondria and mitochondria has a genomic dna i mean as a genome that is completely different from our uh, nuclear dna so that uh, uh, the theory is that mitochondria is uh, a, is a single cell uh, a living organism, uh, independent living organism living in a symbiotic relationship uh, with our uh, multicellular organisms. So microbes uh, uh, originated first in, in the world um, and there is also this whole debate around whether DNA came first or RNA came first. Um, and um, many of the theories do support that RNA could have been the first form of life because many viruses, many microbes do have RNA based uh, genome um, and we all know that uh, all higher or, uh, order organisms including us humans have a DNA based genome. All our genetic information um, is stored uh, in the DNA. Whereas there are viruses that store this information in the form of RNA. Uh, RNA versus DNA, we can argue a lot about uh, how different they are and how uh, uh, DNA is more stable than RNA and hence it's better to store information in the form of DNA. Uh, but uh, due to its uh, the less complex nature, RNA uh, would have been the first uh, form of biological um, uh, form that, that carried the genetic information for the first microorganisms. Uh, so this uh, microorganisms have been dynamically interacting with the environment. They came first, they started interacting with each other, they started interacting with the uh, environment, the abiotic sources and uh, due to this long period of time of them being on earth, they've been able to uh, uh, form exceptional uh, taxonomic and functional diversity. They have evolved uh, to live in extremely uh, high temperatures, low temperatures, high salinity, low salinity. You, you'll find microbes literally everywhere and we find microbes in places where other organisms can't live like places like Antarctica where uh, we see the biological diversity is overall less because of the high temperatures. We do see a lot of microbial diversity uh, even 
uh, in in such uh, climatic conditions so this again uh, shows that how uh, diverse microbes have evolved and and the functional diversity as to what kind of substrates they use what kind of products they produce we have seen this in some of the previous classes about how diverse their substrates can be and uh, this is another uh, important uh, aspect of microbes uh, that is associated with their uh, dynamic interaction over uh, long evolutionary time scale and uh, along this evolutionary time scale a lot of things have changed uh, the climates have changed the high age came uh, there has been really extreme climatic conditions um, many organisms uh, uh, came to exist in and went uh, 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 extinct and through all of this microbes have lived but the selection pressures that they have uh, have also changed across these times the associations that they have formed would have uh, uh, disappeared because uh, some of the organisms themselves disappeared altogether um, uh, for instance dinosaurs dinosaurs uh, lived uh, in the evolutionary uh, evolution like evolutionarily long back they lived and then they went extinct and there would have been a lot of microbes that were associated with them which had to now change host because a whole lot of hosts just went extinct so such things have happened all across the evolutionary history and uh, this kind of uh, events would have exist uh, um, um, uh, would have caused differential selective uh, pressures being uh, put on uh, these uh, microbial communities. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, so there, and along this course of time, there would have also been a lot of thermodynamically unstable resources. So these are the resources that can be broken down and converted into uh, uh, ATP for energy and these microbes have uh, uh, like I said evolved phenomenal functional diversity to utilize many of these thermodynamically unstable resources uh, for production of ATP and hence their survival. Uh, any life form that you can imagine be it higher order uh, organisms or a microbe they need these two basic sources one is a carbon source another one is an energy source for their survival the carbon source forms the building blocks of basically everything that makes up their their body their cells uh, uh, proteins nucleic acid lipid any biological macromolecule that you think of uh, has carbon in it and hence uh, life on earth is carbon based uh, whereas uh, uh, energy sources uh, such as solar energy and, and uh, uh, chemical based energy are energy sources that are being utilized uh, by any of the life forms for the generation of ATP. So these are the most uh, two important uh, sources of uh, um, uh, energy and carbon that is required for the sustenance of life on earth. But, but based on these two things, the energy source, the carbon source and the electron source. So what's the electron source? We look about that a little in detail because all of these processes involve a reduction oxidation redox reaction and this is mainly the transfer of electrons. Uh, there should be an electron acceptor and a donor uh, which will complete this uh, overall um, 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 process so if this electron source is another uh, important parameter that will decide what kind of uh, an organism uh, uh, what, what we can classify them uh, based on these sources uh, so yeah this we looked at like really briefly in in some of, in one of the previous class uh, but yeah just to uh, go over this again uh, if the energy source is a chemical um, it could be an organic chemical or an inorganic chemical and if the carbon source is also organic then it is chemo organo heterotroph uh, so uh, there's autotroph and heterotrophs heterotrophs are organisms that rely on energy sources from other organisms for making their uh, food or for uh, uh, getting their sustenance those are heterotrophs and autotrophs are organisms that um, can produce uh, their own food 
so organic substance uh, itself means that this is uh, uh, produced by some other organism and hence um, uh, anything that uses uh, an carbon source uh, that is organic uh, is an heterotroph so uh, if the energy source is a chemical molecule and the electron source is organic and the carbon source is organic then we get chemo organotrophs uh, chemo for chemical, organic is organo, and for heterotrophs, it's it's that for organic carbon source, it's heterotrophs. Same way, if uh, the or the carbon source is uh, inorganic, for instance, plants use uh, sun's light. Uh, um, uh, that is, uh, uh, I mean, they also produce their own food. They use sun's light. They use um, uh, carbon dioxide from the air, which is an inorganic molecule. Then they are uh, classified as heterotrophs. However, their energy source is not a chemical, so they don't come under chemotrophs, they come under phototrophs. So, uh, chemo organo autotrophs are organisms that, so most of these are uh, microbes. Uh, so, we can broadly put them as algae, microbes, and plants because these are the ones that either produce their food. Uh, we are uh, all of us humans and many of the higher organisms, uh, uh, including uh, herbivores carnivores and uh, uh, and omnivores uh, all of all of those come under heterotrophs because we uh, take the organic material carbon source from other uh, organisms which produce them so uh, if the uh, electron source is uh, inorganic then uh, it is litho uh, so this difference is organo and litho so it will be um, chemo litho heterotrophs or chemo litho autotrophs the same thing uh, can be done. So this whole thing is exactly the same. The only thing that changes is an energy source if it comes from the light. And and uh, uh, plants uh, produce their own food. They get uh, energy from the sun. Uh, so they are photo organo uh, autotrophs. So this this classification is um, as simple as just combining uh, these different sources and. Uh, uh, we can actually assign different organisms to each of this class. So basically all the living organisms that we see around us uh, could be classified in uh, to these eight uh, uh, classes of um, or groups of organisms. Uh, so I mentioned about uh, electron sources, which uh, is uh, also another uh, important uh, thing to consider uh, when we are classifying these organisms. So as you can see, uh, oxidation is a process where um, um, we just uh, put oxygen and it is oxidation and that's as simple as uh, uh, the definition goes and reduction is you remove hydrogen and, and uh, um, that's as simple as the definition is. Uh, but um, uh, at atomic level, what is happening is, uh, let's say there's compound A and compound B uh, and redox reactions are usually uh, combined reactions. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. Let me just reshare the screen. Yes, uh, these are always combined together. Oxidation and reduction go hand in hand because one compound uh, is oxidized and in turn the other compound will be reduced. Uh, and the compound which gets oxidized loses electrons. And uh, we need a reducing agent and an oxidizing agent so uh, this is compound a this has extra electrons so this is ready to donate electrons so there should be an electron donor and an electron acceptor so compound b is ready to accept electrons and hence it's an electron acceptor and compound a is ready to give away electrons because it has extra electrons and hence it is uh, a, a, a donor an electron donor so uh, here as you can see um, a reducing agent is something that is, that can give away electrons to something else and an oxidizing agent is a, a compound which can accept electrons. So these terms should be clear so that when we look further into oxidation reduction reactions, we know exactly what is oxidizing, what is getting reduced, what is getting uh, oxidized and so on. Uh, so the compound uh, that 
uh, loses electrons will get oxidized a reducing agent which is capable of giving away electrons gets oxidized in the process and this process is oxidation in the complete contrary uh, an oxidizing agent which is ready to accept electrons accepts electrons and gets reduced in the process so this oxidation and reduction is seen in all of the biological reactions that we come across it is a very common reaction that happens in in our biological systems and this electron acceptor and donor forms the major uh, part of classifying uh, um, or determining what kind of uh, uh, an organism the microbe is and what kind of substrate it uses and so on uh, so these are the common redox reactions that we see in the nature uh, many of these reactions are constantly happening um, in the soil in the air by it is done by plants this is done by microbes and so on so it's like i said reduction is gain of electrons and oxidation is loss of electrons uh, so here the environment is mentioned as uh, uh, an highly oxidizing uh, environment to an high uh, to a strongly reducing uh, environment. So this is again um, uh, mutually independent. So an, a, an environment that is oxidizing um, is poorly reducing, and an environment that is strongly reducing is poorly oxidizing. And as you can see, there's more oxygen here. And as we go down uh, this arrow mark. Uh, this environment becomes anoxic. Anoxic is an environment uh, that does not have oxygen. And many microbes uh, also are anaerobic or anoxic. That is, they can uh, thrive under uh, uh, conditions where oxygen is not available. So here again, um, it's oxidizing. As we go to suboxic regions, it's mildly oxidizing and mildly reducing. And down here, it's, it's uh, strongly oxidizing. All right. Yeah. Uh, so here, uh, the oxidizing agent is oxygen itself because it's an it's an oxygen rich environment, and whatever happens in this region is aerobic respiration. So all um, uh, higher organisms, including humans, we all do aerobic respiration because we take in oxygen, and this oxygen is what is required to convert the uh, food that we eat. That is, uh, glucose is converted. Uh, into uh, energy um, and water in this process of aerobic respiration. So we all come under this. And one step further down is a mildly reducing condition uh, and the oxygen is again dropping. And this is where nitrification happens. The conversion of uh, uh, nitrates to nitrogen uh, happens under such conditions. So for all of this, uh, different microbes uh, also help us uh, and denitrification is done by nitrifying bacteria. So they require uh, mildly reducing conditions. So for instance, if someone is setting up a reaction uh, where they want manganese reduction or iron reduction to happen uh, and they want a microbe to perform this iron reduction. Uh, but why would we want manganese reduction or iron reduction? Because this uh, again could uh, be employed in agricultural fields or in waste treatment uh, because uh, any of these highly uh, metal rich soil uh, would not support growth of certain uh, plants and hence we might have to uh, treat them or uh, perform some of these processes and uh, in that case uh, one should take into account the kind of uh, the um, environment that there is that is the uh, um, oxygen content of the soil um, this could also uh, be useful in cases uh, where we are looking at water quality uh, to see whether uh, uh, the water is good enough uh, for uh, sustaining um, aquatic life how much of oxygen is uh, dissolved in it what are all the uh, metal contents and so on so manganese reduction iron reduction happens uh, in um, an environment that is um, uh, almost um, strongly reducing uh, whereas uh, processes such as methanogenesis this is again a process that is uh, done by microbes uh, methane is again another uh, 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 organic molecule that is released uh, from several uh, biological processes um, 
usually the smell that we get from uh, decomposing or decaying organic matter like uh, trash whenever a uh, uh, a trash vehicle passes through um, um, you, you always get this really weird smell or if something is decaying in your own house, you get this really weird smell, um, uh, especially from uh, plant peels and, and vegetable peels and so on. Uh, most of that is uh, methane and, and that methanogenesis, that formation of methane, converting uh, carbon dioxide to methane is performed uh, by microbes under strongly reducing conditions. So uh, you might want to remember this progression of what are all the different substrates that gets converted under uh, oxic conditions and anoxic conditions and carbon dioxide uh, to be uh, converted uh, to uh, uh, methane requires a strongly reducing uh, condition. Uh, yes. So uh, uh, this is so this redox status. So what kind of uh, substrate is there, and how reducing or oxidizing that environment is uh, will determine how the microbe will act. Uh, so if you're considering using a particular microbe, you might have to check what kind of uh, uh, the redox uh, status is required uh, for the microbe uh, to sustain and perform uh, the catalytic mechanisms. And the second thing is the different enzymes that are being produced by the microbes itself. Uh, in this case, for producing methanogenesis, they require certain uh, uh, um, enzymes that can make uh, uh, methane. Same way here, uh, in case of the oxidation reduction reactions to happen, uh, they require uh, reductase enzyme and dehydrogenase enzymes. So these are different enzymes that are required uh, for some of these processes to happen. So uh, I said that this oxidizing or reducing environment is necessary, but for this conversion itself, the enzymes are required uh, so that the substrates can get converted because all of these are at the end of the day, um, enzymatic mechanisms. Uh, so this is a, a, a snapshot uh, from what happens inside the cell. So you have the outer membrane, you have the cytoplasmic membrane, and then there are cytoplasmic um, enzymes, and this oxidation reduction reaction happens at the uh, cell wall. So they take in uh, some of the substrates, and then they convert and give out some of the uh, compounds. So this um, uh, catalytic mechanism of the enzyme itself will determine uh, what uh, the microbe will do in, in a given environment. So these are the two important things uh, to take into consideration uh, when we are thinking about utilizing a microbe uh, for a particular uh, application. Uh, and then this is uh, catabolism versus anabolism. So uh, all again, all of the uh, processes that happen in living organisms are either um, catabolism or anabolism. Uh, I think we have gone over the definition of catabolism and anabolism in the previous uh, class, uh, where catabolism means uh, uh, breaking down of existing macromolecules, and animal anabolism is building up of uh, these. Uh, um, macromolecules into higher uh, polymers. So here in this image also, as you can see, uh, polymers such as polysaccharides, lipids, proteins, all of these are complex polymers that we take in as food. Uh, consider anabolism and catabolism inside uh, the human body itself. We, cons we eat starch, which is uh, a complex polysaccharide. We consume fats. Uh, uh, those are uh, lipids that are big carbon chain uh, molecules, uh, we consume proteins which are uh, made up of amino acids. So these things should be broken down further into their building blocks, uh, which could be sugars in the case of polysaccharides, uh, fatty acids in the case of lipids and amino acids in the case of proteins. So this breaking down process uh, again uh, will, uh, uh, so ADP in the uh, presence of an uh, inorganic phosphate uh, produces ATP. So during this breakdown, um, ATP is uh, released. And uh, uh, these molecules are further broken down into carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, water, and ammonia, uh, which are all the different uh, uh, ways that we produced 
during the breaking down of the process. Uh, so any catabolic process, uh, uh, the essentially the idea is to uh, produce energy, ATP. Uh, so here we see that uh, in both of these processes, ATP are released uh, during the breaking down of these complex uh, molecules. And we also get a lot of metabolic in, uh, intermediates like pyruvates and PCA cycle intermediates uh, like uh, salicylate, malic acid and so on, malates and so on. So here uh, we see that uh, ATP is produced um, as a product of catabolism and also other molecules such as CO2 and H2O. So that's why our respiration, uh, we take in uh, oxygen because our respiration is aerobic and we release carbon dioxide during respiration and uh, this oxygen that we take in helps in uh, converting our food uh, into energy which basically powers all our muscles and helps us in uh, doing any of the activities that we do. And this whole thing is applicable for microbes too because they also take in uh, complex polymers and convert them into small molecules um, and produce ATP in the process. Uh, just that the polymers that they take in and the molecules that they produce as intermediates and products could be completely different from what we see uh, in a human uh, respiration process. Uh, whereas anabolism is just the exact opposite, it's you as you can see the arrows indicate uh, that uh, these molecules are converted back. So ammonia that is produced in the body often goes back to produce uh, more amino acids so that we don't uh, waste any of the ammonia. So the ammonia also gets recycled in the process uh, to go back to build some of the uh, proteins inside the body. Uh, so this go backs into the uh, amino acid production uh, uh, pathway. And uh, some of these uh, molecules uh, like glucose, when they are broken down uh, during the catabolism, if there's excess of glucose, uh, they go back and they form uh, these uh, complex polymers which again gets uh, stored in our body and that's how uh, lipids get stored in our body and we often see that uh, um, a hypertension um, is an issue because of um, uh, uh, hypertension and, and cardiac problems. All of this uh, is again uh, associated with a uh, lot of uh, cholesterol and all of that uh, because the excess uh, sugars that we consume uh, gets converted back into some of the cholesterol and, and stored in the body uh, for future use. Um, often we think uh, that the fats that we consume is what is uh, accounting for the cholesterol but that's uh, actually not true uh, these sugar molecules which are usually glucose um, is what uh, uh, goes into this pathway of producing cholesterol and gets stored in the body uh, for easier breakdown so our body cannot store uh, complex sugars but can store cholesterol and that's why it converts any excess of sugar into uh, uh, lipid molecules I mean cholesterol molecules and it is stored uh, so if uh, someone is trying to control cholesterol or trying to uh, check on their weights it's it's important to cut down on carbohydrate content that is glucose and so on uh, rather than uh, controlling uh, the intake of uh, fatty acids or something or even proteins for that case yeah, this was a slight bit of a deviation, but again, uh, uh, this tells us how uh, catabolism and anabolism always works in parallel, and this happens even in the case of uh, the microbes as well. And on contrast to catabolism, uh, just like how catabolism produces uh, uh, ATP molecules, anabolism uh, consumes ATP. Uh, so all of these processes that requires converting back uh, into uh, um, cholesterol or fatty uh, polysaccharides or proteins uh, requires uh, the use of uh, ATP. So here energy is conserved and here energy is utilized. Uh, but in the absence of terminal electron acceptors, the production of ATP is hampered. So uh, uh, all of this process will go smoothly only if there are uh, terminal electron acceptors. So here uh, the uh, small molecules that are produced in the end are terminal electron acceptors. So they are uh, they accept uh, the uh, electrons that are being uh, donated by the uh, donor uh, molecules uh, and they form these final products. But however, uh, uh, if the electron acceptors like uh, water molecules are not formed in the absence of these uh, terminal electron acceptors, uh, this pro production of ATP uh, will not happen. 
so there is also assimilatory and dissimilatory reduction so we saw that redox reactions are a pro part of anabolism and catabolism uh, but here uh, there are also two different things in the uh, reduction mechanism that happens inside the body uh, one is assimilatory another one is dissimilatory assimilatory basically means um, uh, that it's sequestered or assimilated whereas dissimilative uh, is just uh, degraded so that it can be excreted. Uh, so here, uh, uh, this is um, uh, assimilatory and dissimilatory reduction uh, pathway uh, for sulfates, whereas this is for nitrates. Again, uh, these processes are performed by microbes in the um, soil for plants. Uh, they do this even inside the body of other organisms that they are in symbiotic relationship with uh, and so on. So here the sulfate that undergoes uh, dissimilatory uh, sulfate reduction uh, gets excreted uh, in the form of uh, hydrogen sulfate gas. So sulfates are converted uh, into, um, um, uh, so here uh, ATP is again used and then it gets converted into um, uh, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, here we see that uh, electrons are being donated uh, for conversion. Whereas in the case of assimilative uh, sulfate reduction, uh, we can see uh, that uh, this hydrogen sulfide that is produced is not excreted, uh, but it is used for production of uh, organic sulfur compounds uh, such as cysteine and methionine, which are amino acids that incorporate sulfur. So any of uh, uh, whatever that is produced through this process, the assimilative sulfate reduction process is in turn again taken back into producing uh, some of the crucial uh, molecules um, in the body uh, of the organism. So this uh, forms the assimilative reduction process. Uh, the same thing happens here in, in the case of uh, ammonia and the most important uh, thing to note is that the enzymes that are required in, in all of these processes are completely different. Uh, here uh, we require ATP sulfurlase whereas in, in this process it is APS kinase. So uh, the enzymes that are required for these processes are completely different and hence if we are trying to um, let's say engineer a microbe uh, to specifically convert uh, the sulfur uh, in the waste into something specific. So if we want it to be uh, 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 converted into molecules that can again be used for production of amino acids and so on, uh, we should be upregulating uh, uh, this particular uh, enzymatic pathway rather than uh, the dissimilatory pathway. So understanding the different uh, enzymes that are involved in the uh, assimilatory and dissimilatory uh, pathway of reduction is important in case if we want to um, upregulate a certain pathway uh, for uh, tweaking the end product uh, uh, from the process. Uh, I think this is my last slide and I still have like 20 minutes left so I'm going to just uh, quickly explain this one and I'm going to stop uh, so that you guys can ask if there are any questions. Uh, so, methanogenesis, so we spoke about this in one of the previous slides where uh, carbon dioxide is converted into methane. Uh, so, methanogenesis are performed by microbes which are chemolithotrophs. Uh, so, chemo means um, uh, chemical derived, uh, so the, ener the energy source is um, uh, from a chemical and lithotrophs would mean that they're um, um, electron uh, source is also um, an inorganic molecule. Uh, so here, uh, this is how uh, methanotrophs, the ones that produce methane, uh, convert uh, some of the higher uh, uh, micro uh, biological macromolecules such as lipids, polysaccharides, uh, they get degraded uh, to form organic monomers and then there's a further catabolic breakdown by primary fermenters. Uh, so they convert uh, into so there are primary fermenters, secondary fermenters. So these are different organisms that act at different stages, and they produce different enzymes to act at these different uh, molecules along the process. Uh, so fatty acids, alcohol, um, and organic acid are converted into uh, acetates and other small molecules. And throughout all of these processes, uh, carbon dioxide is uh, released. And uh, methanogens are specific organisms that convert this carbon dioxide into methane. Uh, so these are also 
uh, called as methanotrophs. Uh, the metabolic uh, cooperation uh, uh, between these methanotrophs, so these are methanotrophs are uh, microbes that live on other organisms and they take, uh, take this carbon dioxide uh, that is uh, um, being produced during this process and convert them into methane and thereby deriving their energy uh, for their survival. Uh, so these are uh, so syntrophism is where uh, one organism takes the uh, um, molecules that are produced by another organism and uses it uh, for its own survival. So these uh, methanotrophs or microbes that live on these other organisms and they they take this carbon dioxide that is produced uh, by these other organisms uh, uh, and produce methane for their own survival. So th thus. Uh, the, the word syntrophy means cross feeding and hence uh, methanotrophs uh, perform methanogenesis and, and they live in a syntropic relationship uh, with other organisms. So why do we have to know these different things is mainly because of this. Uh, only when we know uh, what kind of substrate they use and what kind of products they produce and what kind of an association they have with a particular system, uh, we'll be able to effectively use them uh, for for our uh, advantage. So if we want to use um, a methano, uh, methanotrophic bacteria, uh, we should be able to know what kind of uh, substrate will be good at, would be useful for them to uh, uh, produce enough carbon dioxide that they can convert uh, uh, to methane and so on. So that's about all I have for uh, understanding the redox reactions and the different trophic classifications. Uh, so this uh, comes from the physiology of the microbe itself and understanding these different things uh, will help us in uh, determining what kind of uh, energy source and electron source and carbon source that we should be using uh, for growing a microbe of our interest. Mm, yep, with this I'm going to stop and uh, okay can we also discuss our doubts related to assignments yes the sessions are specifically for discussing doubts related to assignments so please do ask your questions uh, hitesh if you're if you're still around yes ma'am i'm here yeah uh, thank you ma'am uh, so i have the doubt regarding uh, question of assignment four so there is a question that uh, uh, what is the typical size of agar cell? So, okay. uh, in that uh, assignment, what we have marked is 10 to 20 micrometers. Okay. But uh, it came to be incorrect, and same was discussed in the lecture. So, in a case, I told it is around 10 to 20 micrometers only. Sometimes the typical cell size is that, but sometimes it may be larger or smaller. Yeah. But in the solution, in the the what came out uh, is that uh, that uh, sol in the solution is said it's wrong. Okay. Uh, yeah. It is wrong. Yeah, I think you mailed uh, the uh, NPTEL also regarding this or someone else mailed, I'm not sure. Uh, so yeah, so whatever is in the lecture, so whatever is discussed during the class in the lecture slides is the correct answer. So um, uh, if, if there is any mistake uh, mm. in the uh, um, solutions and if they have uh, put wrong marks I think they will take that into consideration but I'm, I'm not exactly sure how the markings work in NPTEL but yeah so please do follow uh, the things that uh, uh, professor discusses in the lecture slides uh, during the yeah. class but you are right that some cells might be uh, above or below that range but that's the typical uh, size of a micro. Yeah and a similar thing happened with the other question uh, about some uh, composition of uh, elements in the biomass. The ratio that uh, is given um, in the slides for that particular lecture, I could not watch the lecture because I had my CIA internal exams. Okay. So I just read, go, went through the slides and there it says that the ratio uh, and value is given 1.8 carbon something. And I marked the same in assignment, but there also it says it is wrong. Yeah, I think so, there there should there might have been some uh, issue with the portal uh, when they were feeding in the answers. But yeah, be assured that whatever is given in the lecture slides or discussed during these sessions are are the actual 
uh, uh, you know answer so you you can use them for your uh, final exam in case you get these questions in the final exam please do mark uh, whatever is given in the lecture slides or whatever is discussed uh, uh, by the professor in the uh, lecture slides yeah yeah sure thank you yeah thank you Dharma. anyone has any other questions related to today's session or from the previous session i think someone had a question about omics i don't know if that person is uh, still there in I many i don't know if they joined the class uh, but okay maybe i will uh, share last week's slide and uh, quickly talk about omics in case uh, someone didn't understand how exactly the omic technologies worked. So, yeah, so. This was about uh, the different omic techniques that we can use uh, for understanding uh, the amount of uh, contamination or the level of contamination or any of these processes or in general to study about the microbes themselves. Uh, there are a couple of more uh, lectures coming where I will be discussing more about uh, these techniques. Uh, but in general, how these techniques work uh, without going into the actual details of each of them. Uh, so I do have some slides where I'll talk about how NGS works, which is next generation sequencing, uh, which is a most, uh, which, which developed uh, the genomic and transcriptomic techniques a lot. Uh, but in short, uh, genomics and metagenomics involves taking all of the microbial community and uh, uh, looking at their genome, uh, their genetic composition, looking at their genes, uh, uh, the uh, bioinformatic analysis tools and the power of analysis right now and the technology has developed so much that we can actually get the whole genome of an organism, not just a microorganism, even higher order organisms and even human genome is completely sequenced. So we have so much computational power and analysis tools right now that we can get the genome uh, uh, which includes every single gene uh, in the or all of the genetic information in the genome. Uh, so metagenomics genomics is basically doing that but at a larger scale for a community level so usually genomic uh, assemblies are done for a single individual genome but in case of metagenomics, genomics we can sequence portions of certain genes for a whole community uh, especially in cases of uh, environmental samples like water samples or soil samples we can sequence certain uh, uh, genes uh, from all of the microbes that are present in that particular soil and classify them uh, or uh, divide them uh, based on their genetic information. Whereas in case of transcriptomics, uh, this is looking at a snapshot of what is happening uh, at the transcriptome level or the mRNA level. Uh, so whatever the mRNA that are being transcribed uh, from the genetic information at a particular point uh, during a given scenario uh, can be looked at from transcriptomics. And in case of uh, meta transcriptomics, we'll be able to understand uh, the microbial ecology and their um, uh, interaction with their uh, other microbes or uh, the uh, abiotic environment because that will tell us uh, what kind of genes they are producing uh, for sustaining in that environment in case of uh, a contaminated region or uh, or a degraded region we'll be able to know how those microbes are sustaining uh, what kind of genes they are uh, upregulating or uh, producing in higher amounts depending on the mrna that is being uh, produced uh, uh, at the transcriptomic level uh, whereas in case of uh, uh, proteomics this is more valuable because um, uh, the genetic information is just the information about all of the microbes that are there and transcriptomics also only gives us information uh, only up to a point uh, uh, where uh, 
the microbes are producing different mrna but what is actually getting translated because at the end of the day the enzymes that they produce is what is going to be used uh, in all of these processes that we discussed today as well all the catabolic and anabolic processes uh, will be determined uh, by the uh, enzymes that that, that are being produced by the microbes. Uh, so uh, understanding the proteomics will give us more information about what exactly um, 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 is being translated. Uh, so whatever is being uh, produced at the transcriptome level may or may not get converted into uh, the enzyme uh, depending on the conditions. There might be upregulation of certain genes and they might be produced in huge numbers but there could also be some other genes that regulate them and thereby uh, keep a check of those mRNAs from becoming uh, translated into actual uh, proteins and getting folded into enzymes. Uh, so uh, understanding the proteomics or even the meta proteomics of uh, the total protein that is being produced uh, by the microbial community at that place will give us an idea about what kind of substrates they are using uh, for conversion. Uh, into uh, their metabolic products and uh, proteomics and metabolomics give uh, um, uh, the, they go hand in hand they give uh, metabolomics gives more information about the exact uh, substrate that is being converted and the exact uh, metabolized the primary and secondary metabolites that are produced and we'll be able to chart out the whole metabolic uh, pathway by understanding metabolomics and proteomics um, uh, together uh, so these are all uh, the different omic techniques that are currently being used uh, due to the development of uh, um, better high throughput bioinformatic tools that will help us in understanding uh, the uh, contaminated uh, soil region or water or air or any environmental sample for that reason. So in case if uh, the person who asked that question is not there, I'm hoping that uh, they'll be able to get this information by watching the video later on. But in, in any case, if, if there are any more questions from uh, today's session or any of the previous sessions, um, you guys can, can ask, you can post the questions here. And if you have been, if you haven't been able to solve um, uh, some of the assignment questions, you can, you can always ask them here and uh, we can discuss. We still have like eight more minutes so if you guys have questions i do see some people are new so if someone wants to um, introduce themselves ask about you know why they are here what uh, they want to take away from this course the the floor is open uh ma'am uh, yeah uh, this is hitesh pari from central university of rajasthan I'm a MSc Biotechnology student, so uh, I just introduced myself. Uh, Joe, so I had a question, uh, what, do, what is a flu gas, man? Flu gas, and how we can can we con, uh, control or convert it to uh, some product that uh, adds some? Uh, sorry, I didn't get. What is flu gas? Yeah, flu gas. Actually, uh, I read about it, but I could not understand. Like I got the term flu gas but how can we convert it to some value added product uh, uh, flu okay. as in flu. Yeah. i am also not really sure i might have to look up for this one can you tell me like the full question of where you read this or what context you read this from yeah yeah, yeah. it is uh, regarding uh, assignment only and uh, in the same slides i read it of uh, flue gas so uh, the term means key it is uh, some like while the com like combustion is going on uh, the uh, volatile sol uh, substances are released and some dust and all is released so that is a flu gas but uh, i don't know how actually it can be converted to some product that can add some value okay uh, yeah, so I'm not sure if they discussed about converting it into a product of value, but uh, flue gas is is an is a uh, it's basically a harmful exhaust that you get uh, mm, yeah. from any of the uh, um, uh, processes that happen in industries and so on, and it is harmful because it contains dust and and suspended particulate matter, and if it is yeah. released into the atmosphere along with those uh, uh, dirt and and all those harmful uh, chemicals, then it is going to uh, pollute the air and and um, uh, you know cause 
condition and so uh, so on and so forth so it is important to treat flu gas and microbes can be of use there because many of these uh, 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 particles that are suspended uh, especially uh, uh, nitrates or if there are any of those uh, um, harmful uh, uh, products that are suspended along with this exhaust they can be degraded uh, by the microbe before uh, they can be uh, sent out to, to the environment and these degraded products can further be used um, um, uh, for some other purpose so if they have a uh, suspended particulate matter which which can be converted um, into um, um, fertilizers uh, because there are going to be nitrates and phosphates uh, which can be acted on by um, 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 microbes that produce certain uh, enzymes that convert nitrate and phosphates uh, then the converted product in turn can be used uh, as fertilizers or uh, can be used for enriching soil and so on and the air that is released after the treatment with the microbe will be cleaner and will be better um, um, for releasing into the atmosphere so that is another application of where uh, we can use microbes to degrade uh, some of the uh, waste that is there uh, in the uh, exhaust. Um, I hope that is the context in which they would have also spoken about, uh, you know, treating flue gas so that we can um, uh, release it after being treated. Okay, ma'am. Yes. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I got the concept. Thanks a lot. Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, any other question? Um, anyone who joined recently you, if you guys want to introduce yourself and and just mention about why you're taking this course i, I mean that would also help me in understand uh, what more to add to these slides how i can modify these slides because uh, yeah this is my first time doing this uh, pmr of session 2 and it would really be helpful uh, to understand what kind of uh, um, you know students are joining the the sessions and how I can make these sessions uh, better for you guys and more helpful for you guys. Anyone else? Hello, ma'am. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Om Manish Vakade, a B.Tech Biotechnology student from Kolhapur Institute of Technology, Maharashtra. Okay. And I have chosen this course because I'm planning to have a specialization in environmental biotechnology. Okay, that's awesome. That's great. Uh, so you, this is the first time you're attending this session or? Uh, no, ma'am. It's my uh, second time. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, are you finding the sessions useful? Do you want me to add in any more uh, information or something else that will be better or that will make these sessions more helpful? You can also mail me and, and let me know through mail in case, in, the, in case you guys have any suggestions. I can put my mail id also here yeah you can send me a mail here in case you have any suggestions or even if you have doubts uh, during the week about any of these uh, that is not there in the lecture slides you can definitely uh, send it to me hello yes yeah hello sir uh, this is ari rudran Hello, sir. Uh, from Chennai, ma'am. Uh, last week, uh, I unable to attend that class. Um, and now only I joined, re, um, uh, joined this um, uh, online webinar. Okay, okay, sir. Um, uh, in the assignment section, okay. <clears throat> um, the fourth week assignment, I hope that the fourth week. Okay. Uh, question number seven and question number eight, as I written that uh, uh, correct option, read it from that uh, lecture notes. Okay. Uh, but that uh, in the answer, they put wrong. Okay. Is this about the cell size and uh, the other yeah, one? Yeah. 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 yeah I, uh, Hitesh also had the same question. So, uh, 
like what is sorry man no one may join that's yeah, why yeah, i am no, able to yeah, yeah. no issue sir uh, so whatever is actually there in the lecture slides is the correct answer so please okay. uh, uh, use that to, even in your final exam if that question is there please use yeah yeah that's the... that's why i clarify for that only i re, re, <clears throat> unable to join at the 6 o'clock i am no now only able to join ma'am yeah, yeah. No issues, Sorry sir, for the sessions are no issues, sir. The sessions are recorded and it will be uploaded on YouTube, so you can always uh, go over the thank sessions. Thank you, thank you. YouTube. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. So it's seven o'clock. So I'll be ending the session for today. And uh, in case you guys have any doubts in between the week, please do write to me. And uh, if you know people who are taking these. Uh, uh, taking this environmental biotechnology and pital course please do let them also know about these sessions and share the links with them so that if they have any questions they can they can get in touch with me uh, thank you so much everyone for joining thank and you in the next thank session you.